joy and the party to see all of us here again there. And it's such a beautiful day, don't you? I made this joke back in the last church at Iowa and Brother Club. That, uh, man, I didn't have to make that golden drive. I wouldn't have gotten out of that either. Now it's an hour long drive. And it's pretty cold out. So it's good to see you all. Okay, this is Brother Club. Would you please join me in our opening prayer? Oh, God. Oh, God. We are challenged to be patient during the stage of Adam. Yet we remind ourselves of growing frustration as we wait to be slow retail lines, manage our overcooked calendars, wrap gifts, and do online shopping and home decorating in the way we have. Be patient, yes, be patient. In this worshipful moment, strengthen our hearts. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of hope, proclaim peace and a deep and everlasting joy, as a sign that we are those who walk with a stiff and are set because we can, we can see the destination. And as a pure joy, we are ascending to God's promise.
joy and peace. They will receive the glory of Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and Jericho. They will see the Lord's glory, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and support the unsteady knees. Say to those who are panicking, be strong, don't fear. Fear to your God, come to vengeance. With divine resolution, God will come to save you. And the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be clear. Then the lame will leap like deer, and the tongue of the speech will say, Waters will spring up in the desert, and streams in the wilderness. The burning sand will become cool, and the thirsty ground comes to water. The jackal's habitat is a pasture. Grass will become reeds and grass, a highway will be. It will be called the Holy Way. The unclean won't travel on it, but it will be for those walking on that way. Even fools won't get lost on it. No lion will be there, and no predator will go upon it. None of these will be there, only to redeem people walk on it. The Lord's ransom one will return and end his eye with sin, with everlasting joy upon their heads, happiness. And joy will overwhelm you. Grief and wealth will fail you. Your third, but not final, word comes from another gospel. Ruth, uh, from the Lord, verse 42. Mary said, All of my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servant. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next, who honors him as God. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away and the end. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. Please rise to the reading of our second time. Second gospel is the second 
love our neighbor as ourselves. So, in doing so, in loving our neighbor, we're called to give them a fair shake. Because at the end of the day, we're better than our base rings. One line that gets used uh, pretty often to promote this hateful reading of the text is that the Jews killed Jesus. Once again, this is not only wrong, but harmful to the Jewish community. Who crucified Christ? That, that is the question. I'm not not important. Who crucified Christ? That's a good answer. Yes. Pontius Pilate. That's actually perfect. Yes. Pontius Pilate. That's perfect. Thank you. Pontius Pilate was a Roman. Pontius Pilate was putting through the actions of the government. So, who crucified Christ? Rome. The Romans. That's perfect. Who decided who got into the trial of Christ? Who decided who was there when it was decided that Barabbas would be let go instead of Jesus? The Romans. At the end of the day, Jesus was killed by one of the largest governmental bodies, one of the largest military bodies the world has ever seen. Christ was killed by Rome. The ironic part about all this then is that as Christianity was introduced to Rome, the Roman government fell. Now that personally a story in myself. But the rise of Christianity in Rome definitely seems like a factor in the fall of Rome. So, I wanted to make sure that I made some of that very clear. It's a problem that still reverberates through the church today. It's one of the biggest reasons I call for us to do so much self-reflection on our texts and on what we believe. The Gospel reading today from Matthew demonstrates the relational ministry of Jesus and John. Now, I personally haven't taken class on this yet, but I've been informed several times over that while we don't see much of what John the Baptist actually preaches, we don't really see any of his lessons, we can understand what he was preaching about, what he was teaching. We understand that in relation to Jesus. It's an interesting idea, something I'll look into more by someone. But you're probably wondering why are we talking about all this? I went through a, a pretty big section on anti Semitism, and then I briefly touched on this connection with uh, relationship between the ministry of John and Jesus. Why? Well, the United Methodist Church, our church, is a connectional ministry. In a similar, similar fashion. We are not called to do all the work of the body of Christ. We're called to pick our niche and work in sync with the conference. We have the resources, we have the bodies, and with the conference's help, every church has room to do some sort of ministry. John understood that he was not the end, he was not the Messiah, but because he felt the call to ministry, he went out into the wilderness and spread the word. John fulfilled his call. If we're not able to follow or complete our call alone, that's okay. We're not expected. We're not expected to do this alone. God is with us, but not only is God with us, the whole community of Christ backs us. When we work together as one united body of Christ, the church as a whole benefits. The community around us benefits. But we can go farther than that. In Jesus' ministry, he didn't just work with those that believed the same things he did. He reached out to people outside of his own tradition. 
Jesus taught stories using people from other nations. Using them as his examples. We don't have to connect just within our denomination. We have probably hundreds of churches in the area. And even outside the denomination, even outside the Christian church, we can work with people of other religions in an interfaith status. We can do incredible things that show the love of Christ through the world. We can be a good example, and we can be connected. One of the biggest, biggest misunderstandings of Scripture is that God will never give you more than you can handle. You've probably heard that saying before, that well, God will never give me any more than I can handle. Right? This is a beautiful message for some. But blatantly false. Christ gives us what a community can handle. Christ calls us to work together for the benefit of all people. Not When a hurricane, for instance, hits a community, that community it, it doesn't last very long, right? Hurricanes do quite a bit of damage. You wouldn't tell somebody that just went through a hurricane that God doesn't give them more than they can handle, right? You would offer on more support or FEMA. Not just one individual comes together to build these things back up. A community, many people come together. When a tornado hits, when there's a flood, we see groups, like I said, like Encore or FEMA come into an area and they do good for the people. We aren't called to do any less. Now, obviously not every person is going to go out and rebuild houses after an act of possession. That's, that's not realistic. That's not a great act. Not every person is the employee of crisis counseling. Not every person has the gifts to go into an emergency, uh, emergency situation and handle it. However, this doesn't lessen our part and We may not call to run into a burning building, but we can offer a lot. We may not be called to rebuild dams, but we can make a joyful noise and praise God on the top. Whatever our call is, and whatever our mission is, we're called to do that to the best of our ability with the gifts that we have. Because we're connectional, we can do more. Because we're connectional, we have tradition and resources in our form. We have to remember the gifts that we bring to the table. We have to listen to our call and use the gifts we have, because as the church, we as a denomination can bring joy to those in need in this way. When we shed our misconceptions, our misunderstandings, when we get rid of the falsities and just follow our call, when we share the love of Christ in the world, we bring joy to the world. We make a joyful noise, and it shows the world the love and the light of Christ. There is so much darkness in our world. We are called to be a light in the world. Think of a Christmas tree. I know it, it sounds silly, but stay with me for a second. We, as the church in the world, are like a Christmas tree. <coughs> Anytime we use our gifts to bring hope or love or joy, we like a small section of that tree. When, and if you think of a Christmas tree, it doesn't actually take that many lights before the whole thing is flown. You probably know the song, It Only Takes a Spark to Get a Fire Gun. We want to bring this joy, this, this love, this hope into the world 
because especially in this season of darkness, this is what the world needs most. There's so much going on around us. But with the advances in technology, we know every bad thing happening all around the world in an instant. It can be easy to shut down in this environment. It can be easy to seclude yourselves. But we're called to do more. We're called to be better. Jesus called us to walk a difficult path. Jesus knows we don't have an easy road ahead of us, but he still calls us down that path. Remember a while back we talked about how Jesus doesn't ask us to do things that we're not able to do. He wouldn't be asked us if it weren't possible. This week, I want you to think about that. Even though Jesus knows the path will be difficult, even though we know the path will not be easy, we're called to spread the light of Christ for people engulfed in darkness. So go out and help. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, would you repeat the video? Um, yesterday, so I was watching here for the families, and I want to thank everybody for being so generous. We have to make, <coughs> excuse me, I know a basic truth that's really got out of the way to buy it. You have so much food. It's amazing. That's really adorable. That's incredibly helpful.
spoken and unspoken. Please join me in the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, our Lord 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 in heaven.
community. We are a light in the dark. Go out and light up the world.